The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the standard in the rare coin grading industry. To learn more about their current programs and labels, visit PCGS.com. This week on the Coin Week podcast, we bring up Pat Heller in order to find out where gold and silver stands in the age of Trump. Has good government returned to the USA? And if so, why would conservative-leaning stackers favor responsible government over chaos? Is something more at play? We also look to find out why the U.S. Mint's bullion sales have sharply declined over the course of the past two years. All this and more next on the Coin Week Podcast. Hey, Pat, thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thank you, Charles. So we're now one year into the age of Trump. Responsible government has returned and everything's going great. No turbulence at all. Just clear skies ahead. And since government spending is down and conservative principles are now in full bloom, there's probably no reason at all for people to hedge against the collapse of the dollar and move towards safe haven assets like gold, right? I think you should uh, probably not put a tryout for a career as a comedian. <laughs> uh, but there is uh, a lot of hope that good things will happen in the market, and some good things have happened. Uh, and that may be detracting from people's concerns about uh, financial things or negative financial news and uh, detracting from people wanting to own precious metals as a way to uh, avoid the risk of loss of uh, paper asset values. Well, it is true what you said. You know, the economy has been moving in the right direction, although, you know, it hasn't been as strong as everyone would have liked. We haven't had a negative growth, however, since 2009. It's taken several years to experience a, a proper recovery from the recession, uh, and many sectors of the economy have not been the same. So I understand that. But for gold, I'd say in the past year and a half, you know, we've seen an increase of about 100 to $150 per ounce in spot. Uh, and with this going on, it seems weird to me that bullion sales at the men have essentially crashed over the course of the last two years, even with spot prices inching up. What is the correlation between what's going on in the precious metals market and the Mint's current inability to move the levels of bullion product that we're accustomed to seeing. Uh, that's a sign uh, going, uh, you might say, across the United States and is uh, distinct from what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, demand for uh, physical gold has been uh, strong in uh, India and China and Germany and in England. Uh, and but that's not what's been going on in the United States. Uh, if you look at uh, search terms on the internet, there are the number of times that people do searches on the internet by terms like American Gold Eagle. Uh, those searches are way down uh, compared to over a decade ago. Uh, so there is some complacency, you might say that uh, you know, the world's not going to come to an end next week, so you don't have to uh, protect yourself from the dollar crashing. Uh, actually, by the way, search terms that recently are getting a lot more uh, interest are along the lines of World War III. So that might be a sign of what people are worried about, and they're not worried about uh, the U.S. dollar or... Uh, the U.S. economy. Obviously, that's more of an existential concern, I'd say. I do think that when you look back at the past two years or so, one of the things that did have an impact on the precious metals market was the boom and bust cycle of the cryptocurrency market. Bitcoin was on an utter rampage, and it got to the point where I was actually fielding calls from coin dealers would tell me that they were advising their affluent clients to get into cryptocurrency and move away from gold, saying that this is now a digital age and that the analog is old, gold you know, being the analog, I guess. Uh, yes, 
uh, at my own company, we did have a noticeable amount, but not a groundswell of people that did liquidate uh, precious metals, announcing that they were going to use it. Uh, and this was last year to buy cryptocurrencies. Uh, there has been a very small number of people that said they cashed out and took some profits and used that to purchase uh, precious metals. But the, the ratio is a lot more of people selling precious metals to buy cryptocurrencies. But on both sides, the, the number of such transactions was actually quite small. Uh, I suspect most people bought cryptocurrencies who also held gold and silver actually held on to their gold and silver and just use other sources of uh, maybe selling stocks or something to buy cryptocurrencies. Uh, more than letting go of the precious metals. Now, CoinWeek considers cryptocurrencies to be a numismatic topic, full stop. That's why we cover them in our in our newswire. But the fact is that had you bought into Bitcoin when it was soaring past $10,000, you may very well find yourself buried in it right now. And cryptocurrencies have not yet proven that they have like any real staying power. They do not have the benefit of thousands of years of traditional use as a store of wealth. And there is no official cryptocurrency that is guaranteed to stay in use should others fall by the wayside. In fact, it's not even settled what the government is going to do in terms of regulating it. The cryptocurrency rush reminds me in some respects of the free banking era, where you had a system of unregulated or let's say underregulated private currencies entering into the market. You know, economist George Selgin, who we had on last year, said that the government never truly allowed free banking to flourish. But I think we can see through numismatic history that this system proved to place more risk on the holder of the banknotes. Whereas now, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, they are still new and have not yet proven that they have that long-term value, like I said. Everything about them is exciting and new and entirely speculative. Whereas, you know, a gold bar that you have is a gold bar that will be accepted here and in Saskatchewan and wherever you happen to try to redeem it. Yes. Uh, and beyond just uh, gold being the same no matter where in the world you are, it's the same no matter what time you are. So an ounce of gold from a thousand years ago or ten years ago is still an ounce of gold today. Uh, you can't say that for the uh, the paper currencies. Uh, I I think pretty much all of them are well down uh, in relation to an ounce of gold from where they were a decade ago. So would you say the political leanings of folks that you primarily sell bullion to uh, is conservative for the most part? Uh, definitely. Uh, we have uh, significant percentage of our customer base are people in the military, for instance, that uh, don't like what they see going on in the world. Uh, they're, even though they may uh, currently be in the government or they have worked for the government, it doesn't mean they necessarily trust what the government is doing. And uh, I would say most of the demand is from customers that have developed a distrust of government or the competence of government. So does that mean that you would generally see a shift in their attitudes about buying metals when the party they favor is in power, as opposed to, you know, when they're in the minority uh, or when we have a divided government? And I ask this because this is something I always find interesting about the psychology of stackers, especially ones who follow politics, you know, who see bad government as a, uh, as a call for them to prepare for some sort of cataclysmic event, uh, an economic or political collapse. You know, given the way American politics is going, it seems like every election cycle is now turning into Sherman's March, you know, total scorched earth campaigns. Uh, you know, the, the sentiment is, if we lose, it's Armageddon and our way of life is over. And of course, you know, it never truly plays out this way. But you would think that if you're a little bit cynical about the nature of American politics and you kind of see the game for what it is uh, and we're heavily invested in metals, that you would see a benefit for having a government that really isn't sound or effective because then your holdings would increase in value 
putting you in a better position, you know, when it all hits the fan, if it ever does. I mean, if I was in the stock market and I held a substantial position in a stock, I'd want it to perform well. You know, I wouldn't be actively trying to participate in something that would hurt my position. Uh, we should only hope that uh, the concept of good government would actually happen. Uh, and if in the process of doing that, the value of gold and silver fell to virtually nothing. Uh, even though I, I personally own some, I have a vested interest in the value of the gold and silver I own. Uh, I would be thrilled to have a, a world at peace and a good government if the cost of it was making my precious metals worthless. Do you believe that's a sentiment that's uh, shared by most people who buy precious metals? Uh, no, because I don't think uh, we're going to get to the stage of uh, good government. If the men is showing you slowing signs of sales, does that mean that the material that is already in the marketplace, you know, there are hundreds of millions of silver gold eagles in the marketplace, uh, is also slowing down in terms of demand or... Has that demand not really been affected by what's going on with the 2017 and 2018 production? Uh, I think what's going on is something that we have seen with other issues over the years. When a certain number of product has been sold onto the market, and you can look at the South Africa Krugerrand or the, uh, for instance, the Mexico 50 peso or the Austria 100 Corona gold coins, as examples, uh, at any time, there's a certain quantity of this product being liquidated on the secondary market. When the quantity on the market is large enough that uh, new demand can be met through secondary liquidation, uh, the sales of the newly produced coins decline. So the Austria 100 Krona, the Mexican 50 peso, and uh, South Africa Krugerrand are no longer made in mass buying quantities. I believe the first two aren't even being made at all right now. Uh, but at some point, you will see where the Canadian Maple Leaf or the American Eagle have been on the market long enough, and uh, they have enough already in uh, people's hands that the liquidation that just goes on at any time will meet new demand. Uh, that's what's happened with the American Eagle the last, last several months, is it is possible in some instances for people to purchase a prior dated uh, American Eagles at a cost lower than the U.S. Mint is charging its authorized purchasers to buy the 2018 dated product. Uh, and you can get close to that and sometimes uh, buy some of the Silver Eagle dollars uh, from prior years cheaper than what the Mint's charging the authorized purchasers for the 2018 product. Uh, so the, the new buyers are being sensible. They're saying, I want to get more gold or silver for my money. It's not that important that it be dated 2018. I see that specifically when you bring up the Krugerrand. Um, that's actually one of the big things about the Kruger and the European market where, you know, that coin is, is it's more popular than it is here, you know, as a bullion coin. Uh, the Kruger and has become synonymous for generic gold. So the current prices of Kruger and is coming out of the South African Mint exceeds the cost of generic gold that's already in the marketplace. So the South African Mint doesn't sell the coins at the levels they used to, even though the Kruger and is heavily traded. Uh, on top of that, there's more competition, you know, with private mints and other state mints who also produce bullion. Uh, there's another trend that I anticipate, and that is in the Far East, the demand is for pure gold products, and uh, metric weights of products is more popular than troy ounce weights. So uh, you saw a few years ago that the Chinese panda coins switched from being in troy ounce weights into grams, like instead of an ounce panda, now it's a 30 gram panda. Uh, the American Eagle gold issues are not pure gold. Uh, South Africa Krugerrand, Austria 100 Krona, Mexican 50 pesos are not pure gold. So I think that limits their uh, appeal in the Far East. 
Uh, and those are major markets uh, for buying gold nowadays. Absolutely. And, and the interesting thing is, once the Chinese panda went to the metric system, you know, it suffered some declines in popularity in the West because Western buyers had become accustomed to buying one ounce coins. But what is also interesting is that Asia is the largest growth sector for bullion coins and numismatic coins in the market today. Do you see the Chinese government moving to this metric system as a way to protect their own market against foreign precious metals products? Or was the Chinese market already pretty much closed off from precious metal coin imports? It's going towards metric system, and this is just part of it. The Shanghai Gold Exchange is not trading uh, 100-ounce gold bars like you are in uh, New York Comex or 400-ounce bars like the London market. They're trading kilogram bars. Uh, and when the uh, Chinese Central Bank, for instance, is uh, importing uh, gold bars from, the, well, they go through Switzerland or Singapore or Hong Kong, uh, but they're importing these 100-ounce and 400-ounce gold bars. Those are being melted down to turn them into kilogram bars. So uh, the China is switching their panda coins is just going along with this uh, developing trend. One of the ways that Chinese precious metals investors can get involved in coins is through their banks. Uh, it surprises me that the government there, which one would fairly call restrictive in many cases, would allow the practice where one's financial institution could recommend diversification into things like numismatic coins and bullion coins. And this may be one of the reasons why that market is growing at the rate it is, you know. Um, I wonder, uh, would it be a good idea f for our market in the U.S. if banks here were actively selling bullion products to their customers, whereas you could go to the bank teller and convert some money in your account to a silver or gold bullion coin. Would that help or hurt the precious metals marketplace as it currently exists? Uh, if it did, it would hurt uh, the coin dealers, but it's not, uh, America isn't ready for that to take place. In the case of China, owning a physical gold and silver is a major life activity. Uh, it, all the families have it. Uh, in India, people have physical gold and silver as opposed to bank accounts. So there it would make sense for uh, the banks to get in on a very popular form of investment. In the United States, uh, it's still a very small percentage of the public that owns physical gold or silver, and it's just, just not a big enough market niche for the banks to profitably get involved. Well, I understand that, but if you consider the scenario where you'd go to that bank teller and they're have on display the current spot price of gold or silver bullion, and you would buy it over the counter. And the key for the bank is that they would hold it in their vault because, you know, you wouldn't want to have somebody store a consequential amount of metal in their home, you know. Uh, but it's something I think about when you consider how much retail acreage has been lost over the years by the, uh, by the rare coin industry. Whereas 20 or 30 years ago, you'd have maybe one or two or more coin shops in a major city, maybe one in most towns. Now coin shops are fewer and far between, and most aren't really the kind of places that would inspire that spark of imagination uh, to build a new generation of collectors, you know, like the great shops from the past. Uh, at least this way, even if it was only bullion, everyday Americans would be seeing precious metals coins presented to them in a clean and safe place uh, in an everyday location. And I think that might make owning coins seem like a proper, maybe even a smart thing to do. Uh, well, the trend is that uh, coins are used a lot less in commerce today, uh, and also currency is used less than it was decades ago. Uh, there's a lot of uh, mature coin collectors nowadays who got their start collecting because they're newspaper carriers where at the time the carriers were the ones that collected from customers, so they handled a lot of money and coins and got an interest from that. Uh, today the uh, newspapers have a lot smaller circulation and the subscriptions are handled by the newspaper rather than the carrier, so uh, you're not having the same uh, percentage of young people 
uh, seeing uh, coinage in everyday commerce. I totally agree with that. Um, also, you know, when the United States switched from silver coinage to clad coinage, that was a fundamental change in the way Americans saw their coins. You know, it also put it into an era where one, armed with some degree of collector knowledge, could pull coins out of change and take them to their local shop and make a profit off of them. You know, with all this old money gone, there aren't really many opportunities left to pull something truly exciting or valuable out of change. Also, collectors see this moment as a divide between coins that were worth something and coins that are not. Uh, today's coins are pretty much only worth what you can buy with them and, and nothing more. And uh, I, think, I think this change really impacted coin shops because the lead generation, especially with young people getting into the hobby, bringing their change in to sell it, it just isn't there anymore. I remember, you know, as a kid, spending hours sorting through a giant jar of pennies and pulling out over 100 circulated wheat cents, uh, thinking that I would be able to take them to my coin shop and cash them in. And, you know, it was when I was told that my coins weren't worth anything that I was, I was like super bummed out. And, and if I wasn't a total coin weenie, maybe I would have given up on coins at the time. Uh, and then uh, on the other hand, you, you also have the modern men issues, you know, the commemorative issues, which were sold at these big premiums, which later, yeah, when people tried to sell them to dealers, uh, they were told they weren't worth much more than their precious metals content, thereby squandering even more goodwill. Uh, none of this was good for our business. So that, that's why I think perhaps having an institutional tactic to sell coins or introduce coins to people might be a good idea for, for our hobby. Uh, there's uh, oh, the Royal Canadian Mint, for instance. Uh, the last I knew, they were producing at least 300 different Canadian coins a year. Uh, they have a number of variety of collector series. Uh, when you have that much different product coming on the market, uh, if you can sell them, that means the collectors don't spend the funds buying older collectible coins. Uh, and also, it, uh, it, it means that when people want to resell the modern issues, uh, there's so much of this kind of product on the market that if the original stuff was sold at any uh, co high collector price rather than bullion related price, uh, the prices are going to tend to fall, which discourages few people from buying future issues. Do you believe that there's any buying opportunity at the right price for these modern and ultra modern mint issues? You know, many of which, you know, feature cutting edge technology very artfully executed. I mean, if you can buy them at the right pricing levels at or near spot, I mean, do you see any downside at all to collecting those as opposed to just straight up bullion? If you can buy them at a bullion related price, uh, it's not a bad thing to think about. Uh, for instance, uh, the gold American Eagle proofs are, are now available. It's kind of a hit or miss basis because it depends on uh, collectors liquidating them. But you can buy the proofs in a lot of instances for very close to the same price as the bullion uh, gold eagles. Uh, when you do that, uh, I'd say there's not much downside. So uh, you should seriously consider it, but not at the prices that the mint's charging for the new issues. Uh, the one area where I think there is some possibility of having uh, numismatic value over bullion value in the future uh, could be with the uh, bullion issue five ounce silver uh, America the beautiful quarters. Uh, in the last three or four years, I think there's only a couple of issues that have an, a minage of more than 40,000 pieces. Uh, a lot of them have been right at 20,000 coins. Uh, and you can buy the, the bullion version for close to the same cost per ounce as you would pay for the silver eagle dollars, uh, which has uh, minages up in the many millions of coins. So that would be one area that uh, I'd say someone could consider having a collection of them uh, there's been over 40 issues out so far, and most of them you can buy uh, fairly close to uh, 
uh, bullion value that uh, down the road may have some collector premium to them. But uh, mostly the rule is that if you buy stuff from the Mint, and that would include the uh, special 5-ounce silver quarters uh, that the Mint sells with their finish, uh, that's not a good uh, prospect for appreciation. Let me ask you a uh, philosophical question about buying metal. I think when we talk about precious metals, coins, there's a big dividing line between people who can afford to buy silver coins and those that can afford to buy gold coins. I think an easy way to get past people's internal view of which side of the line they fit is by looking at purchases of metals in $200 increments. If you can afford a couple silver eagles, then you probably can afford $200 when put into gold. So if you had a customer seeking your advice in which metal to buy in $200 increments, would you advise them to use that to buy $200 worth of gold or to take that money and buy silver instead? Uh, right now, I'd uh, suggest buying silver. I think the future prospects uh, for price appreciation are stronger for silver than for gold. Uh, the gold-silver ratio is now over 80, and I, uh, my non-scientific long-term equilibrium expectation is it'll be somewhere in the 35 to 40 range, which means that whatever happens, the price of silver would do twice as well as gold. And you do have the past track record of when prices rise, silver rises by a higher percentage than gold. Uh, which also has a negative that when prices fall, the silver price falls a greater percentage than gold. But uh, right now, I think the prospect for appreciation is uh, much better than for uh, further decline in prices. So uh, and we have customers that uh, come in every week or two weeks when they get paid and they pretty much buy silver because that's what their budget can afford. Uh, maybe once they have a good uh, base of silver holdings, then they could save up for a little bit to buy an ounce of gold. But uh, even though uh, I like both metals, I, I definitely am more in favor of owning silver than gold right now. Does platinum or palladium figure into your equation? Or are these still esoteric metals when it comes to stacking purposes? Uh, platinum and also palladium are precious metals, but they're not really monetary metals. Uh, uh, you do have the price of uh, platinum well below gold right now, which is something I was uh, predicting would happen 10 years ago, and it took several years to get there. It may remain there, but actually the discount of platinum to gold nowadays is uh is pretty low and i think there could be some uh prospect of uh well platinum may have some appreciation potential partly because the price of palladium got so high uh so i am um, uh I think uh, owning a little bit of platinum, not a lot, as a speculation, uh, may be worth considering now. Last thing, Pat. Finish my sentence. The United States of America will never return to the gold standard because... Uh, it can't afford to. It has just too much debt, uh, and a return to the gold standard would lead pretty much to the collapse of the U.S. dollar. The great Pat Heller, folks. Well, Pat, thanks for coming on, sharing your insights about the psychology of stackers and explaining what is going on with metals right now and for being a fun interview. Talk to you soon, Pat. Thank you, Charles. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Remember, you can download all 94 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.